Good morning. This morning we're going to talk about the book of Esther and the amazing story that we find there. So before we begin the study, we'll just invite you to bow your heads as we ask the Lord's blessing on the study. Our dearest Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for your word, which reveals to us the things that are going to happen in the future. Lord, may we appreciate these words. May we understand their importance for us today as we see the end time significance of what you've recorded in the history of your people in the past. So may these words touch our hearts. May they help us to be prepared for the trials that we may face in our day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why should we be concerned about what the book of Esther has for us today? And there's a Bible principle we find here in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be. Can you see what that's saying? In other words, things that have happened in the past, God's recorded this specifically because similar things are going to happen again in our day. And by reading the history of God's people in the past, we can see what God is going to do for us in the future and leading us through trials and crises. That's why this story of Esther is very interesting. We read this to get the context of the story. Ahasuerus, he's the king, he was called king of kings in the Bible, reigned from India even under Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. So that's a huge area from all the way from in Africa right across to India, massive area. King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. So here's a little map showing the extent of his reign, a huge reign, and apparently very wealthy. They brought in a lot of tribute from all these provinces that the Medes and Persians were ruling over. And here's a, a relief discovered in an archaeological dig showing King Ahasuerus. Now the Bible tells us in the third year of his reign, he made a feast on the seventh day when his heart when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded to bring Vashti the queen before the king to show the people and the princes her beauty. She must have been very beautiful. And so the king asked for the queen to come so he could show off to all his princes what, how beautiful the queen was. But what do we read? It says, but the queen Vashti refused to come. Therefore was the king very wroth. Then the king said to the wise men, What shall we do unto Queen Vashti? And Memukan answered, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. So the advice was, no more. She refused the king's commandment, so she wasn't to come any more. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memukan. Now, if you read the whole story, I'm just giving the summary here. They were saying, what if she's a bad example to all the other wives in the kingdom? That wouldn't be good. And that's why they treated her so harshly. Then said the king's servants, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now we introduce in the story the hero of the plot, Mordecai and his cousin Esther. It says, Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. And he brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, as uncle's daughter. So here's this Jewish man that was in the Medo-Persian Empire, obviously a descendant of those Jews that had been taken to Babylon captive. And Mordecai had a cousin, or was his uncle's daughter, Esther was her name. When the king's commandment and his decree was heard, many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace. And Esther, it says, was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Hegai, the keeper of women. So Esther was brought in amongst these other maidens that would be presented before the king. 
Now there was a long period of purification before these maids were presented before the king. We read this in chapter 2. Now when every maid's turn was come to go in unto King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months, so a whole year of waiting, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odours. So you can imagine that, six months for these various purifications, six months each, that's 12 months before these women were presented before the king. And the king loved Esther, it says, above all the women, and she obtained grace and favour, so that she, he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther came out above all the other women in this beauty pageant, if you want to call it that. So the king chose Esther. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. Now here comes another subplot in this story, which is very significant later on. Here were these two chamberlains of the king, and it names them here, sought to lay hand on the king. And we're told the thing was known to Mordecai. So here were these two guys plotting to lay hand on the king, or kill him, essentially assassinate him, and Mordecai learnt about this who told it unto Esther the queen and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name so because of his connection with Esther he told Esther and Esther told the king this is what's happening there's two guys plotting to assassinate you when inquisition was made of the matter it was found out therefore they were both hanged on a tree so these guys were executed for their conspiracy to kill the king. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now that's a little subplot that took place shortly after Esther became queen. And God obviously done this to set up something he was going to do later. You know, it's interesting, the book of Esther, it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God by name. But we can see God's handwriting, his fingerprints, all through the story in the way that he sets things up. So it has God's autograph, if you like, all through the whole book. Now we are introduced to another figure in this story, a guy called Haman. This is in chapter 3. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Now this is the, the enemy, the bad man of the plot, so to speak. And it's interesting to note that the word Haman, the name Haman, literally means, according to Strong's here, it means magnificent. So here's a man whose name was Magnificent. He must have been magnifying himself to be called Magnificent, and we'll see why that's relevant later. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. And obviously this annoyed Haman. He liked to be considered magnificent. But Mordecai did not acknowledge this. So what happened? It says, when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then Haman was full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they showed him the people of Mordecai. So the people said, look, Mordecai is a Jew, and there's Jews all through the kingdom. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So here's the first great anti-Semitic recorded in history, Haman didn't like Mordecai. When he found out that Mordecai was a Jew, he wanted to kill all the Jews. And this is what he did. Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Now was that true? Were the Jews anti-government? Were they disobeying 
the laws of the land? No, the answer is no, they weren't. In fact, they were some of the most law-abiding citizens. And there's even a lesson in this. Should we not, as Christians, be law-abiding law-abiding citizens? Is that right? We should be the most law-abiding citizens of the country, to set an example. Our issue is not with the government at all. Neither was Mordecai. In fact, Mordecai was part of the government, as we'll see. So this is actually a false accusation. This is a lie. Haman is trying to persuade the king to kill the Jews, ultimately. And so he's sowing lies here. He went on to say, Therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. Sadly, the king listened to what Haman said, and it says, The king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, and the king said, Do as it seemeth good to thee. So he delegated Haman the authority. And what did Haman do with this authority that he got? There was written according to all that Haman had commanded to the rulers of every people of every province and sealed with the king's ring. And this is what he wrote. And letters, the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is a month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Now let's look at this verse for a moment. Here was this letter sent by post to the whole kingdom, to all the leaders of the provinces, to basically kill all the Jews on a given date. Do you see that? They set a date in the future, and they said on this day all the Jews can be killed, caused to perish, destroy them, and it says to take the spoil of them for a prey. What does that mean? Basically what this commandment was doing was saying anybody can kill any Jew and spoil them or take their possessions for their own. That was the incentive given for this decree to be carried out. In other words, any citizen of the Medes and Persians Empire could go and kill the Jews and take their possessions. That was the death decree under this Ahasuerus. What did Mordecai do when he heard this? Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. This was a death sentence on his people. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. They must have said, Mordecai is wailing out in the streets. Then was the queen exceeding grieved, exceedingly grieved and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai. They must have come and said, look, he's rent his clothes, he's got ashes all over. So she sent some new clothes to him and to take away his sackcloth from him, and he received it not. And Mordecai told him, this is the chamberlain that came to give these clothes to Mordecai, of all that had happened. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king, and make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. Remember, Esther was a Jew as well. So she's technically under this death decree too. And then there's this famous statement that Mordecai sends to Esther. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Remember, Esther, this humble little daughter or cousin of Mordecai, who is now queen of this huge empire, and he's reminding her, this may be the very time, this is the reason why at this time you are queen of this empire for this situation. Now there was a problem, because for Esther to go to the king without an appointment was a death decree. Here's what it says in the Bible. Whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. So if you went before the king in these days, without an appointment, you could be put to death 
unless the king held out his scepter to invite you in. Very important. So Esther, by making this appeal for her people, was actually putting her life at risk already, just by going before the king. And she could balk at that. But did she? She was very wise. What she said was, before I do this, we need to have all the people praying for this. Esther bade them, fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she said, let's fast and prepare for this. And she was willing. She said, if I perish, I perish. She's willing to put her life on the line to save her people. So after the three days, Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne. So here it is. This is the moment. Everything hangs in the balance at this point. And when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favour in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter. Whew! First barrier passed. Then the king said unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? And it shall be even given thee unto half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So Esther was going to invite the king and Haman to a meal, a banquet, and there she was going to put forward her request. Now meanwhile, Haman was plotting something quite different. <laughs> Interesting story, there are all the ironies in this. Then said Zeresh, this is Haman's wife, and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made, of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. So Haman was plotting the death of Mordecai at this point, and his friends and his wife were encouraging him in this. Now, here's another little interesting province, providence that was taking place. That night, the king couldn't sleep. Do you remember another story in the Bible where a king couldn't sleep? Remember Daniel chapter 2? And God was leading in that because he gave him a dream and took a sleep from him after that. Well, here again, here's a king that couldn't sleep. It says, On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. Maybe he perhaps hoped that this might help him go to sleep. Maybe it was very boring, who knows. But anyway, he had these chronicles read before him. And guess what was read out of those chronicles? You remember the story of the two guys that were going to assassinate the king? And Mordecai heard about that. And it was all recorded in these books. So guess what the king heard about? And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thano and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. So the king's listening to this late at night, couldn't sleep, and he hears the story of how Mordecai had saved him from this plot, this conspiracy. And the king said, What honour and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? The king's servants replied, There is nothing done for him. Now watch what happens here. This is amazing how God set this up. Haman comes along. All happy, he's been told, advised by his wife and his friends, look, set up a gallows, then go and ask the king to let you hang Mordecai on this gallows. So Haman comes along to the king, and before he can speak, the king says this, The king said unto Haman, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour? And what does Haman think? Oh, that's got to be me. Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honour? more than to myself. He obviously had a high opinion of himself. And he began thinking, Ooh, now what would I like? Because the king's going to give it to me if I ask. So what happens? Haman dreamed up something that he would like to have happen to himself. And this is what he said. Haman answered, Let the royal apparel be brought, 
and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honour. And he could probably just imagine himself, Oh, I'm going to enjoy this, sitting on this horse with the king's crown on and the king's robes, and everybody being told, This is what the king does to those who the king delights to honour. And then comes the bombshell. And the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. And you can just imagine Haman's jaw dropping. This wasn't meant to be what was meant to happen. He came to ask the king to give him permission to hang Mordecai. And now Haman's being told to go and honour Mordecai. <clears throat> and the Bible says, Then took Haman, he didn't question what the king had said, Haman took the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai, and brought him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour. Can you see the irony here? Here's Haman saying before Mordecai, this is how people are honoured, whereas Haman thought he would be the one on the horse initially. What was going on in Haman's heart as this was happening? Well, we can read, Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hastened to his house mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh his wife and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Poor Haman. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Remember the banquet that Esther had set up? They said, quick, come on, you've got to go to this banquet. And what took place at this banquet? Actually, there were two of them, but we just shut summarizing the story here then esther the queen answered and said if i found favor in thy sight o king and if it please the king let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request for we are sold i and my people to be destroyed to be slain and to perish so at this banquet esther explained to the king we've been sold to death and the king must have been horrified. And the king, Hazarus, answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? Who was it? It was Haman sitting right there at this banquet. And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Sitting right there, obviously. And then Haman was afraid before the king and queen. He thought, What have I done? I'm done for. In fact, it says, the king arising from the banquet of wine and his wrath went into the palace garden. He must have been furious. He stood up and stormed out. And we read that when the king came back into the palace of the banquet, Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. What do you think he was doing? He was pleading for his life. He was Esther had just pointed to him and said, this is the man that's signed us to death, and he must be before her saying, please help me, because he knew he was in big trouble. And sure enough, what happened? They hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. See the irony there? Haman had set this gallows up to get rid of Mordecai, and who ends up getting hung on this gallows? Haman himself. The very thing that he had prepared for God's people was used on him. God has an amazing way of turning things around, doesn't he? Incredible. Then was the king's wrath pacified. But that wasn't the end of the problem, was it? Because this death decree had still gone out. Do you remember the Medes and Persians couldn't change their laws? Do you remember the story of Daniel? When the people plotted against Daniel and got the king to pass this decree that no one pray to anybody but the king for 30 days. You remember that? And when the king found out that that was set up to get rid of Daniel, he wanted to change the law, but he couldn't because the Medes and the Persians couldn't change their laws. And the same here. This death decree under the Medes and Persians, the death decree against the Jews, has gone out. What do they do? They couldn't rescind it. 
So the Bible says, Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And this is what they did. This is the solution they came to. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of the king of Hazuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar. So the Jews were given permission to fight back, essentially, on that same day to stand for their life. So anyone who wanted to come and do the Jews a mischief and kill them, so to speak, they could pro defend themselves. And in every province the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Very interesting. So this is a total turnaround from being appointed to death to now it was a day of joy and gladness. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And you know what happened during this time? It says they hanged Haman's ten sons. Haman had ten sons, obviously, and they were executed as well. They were hung, it says, hanged on the gallows. Then Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces to establish this among them, that they should keep the fourteenth day of the month of Adar and the fifteenth day of the same yearly. So they decreed these two days to be a feast to commemorate this event. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day. Wherefore they called these days Purim, after the name Pur. Apparently, if you study that through, Pur means casting of lots, and apparently Haman chose this specific day by casting lots, you see. So they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur, which means to cast lots. The Jews ordained that they, should, they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And did you know that the Jews do this even to this day? You can look up Purim, this is from Wikipedia, and you can see it's from Purim, meaning lots. And it's a Jewish holiday. Commemorates the saving of the Jewish people from Haman, who was planning to kill all Jews. And you can see this is one of the prime feasts that they have. Here's a table of the feasts that the Jews have. And you can see Purim here. It's celebrated around about March in our calendar. Last year it was March 12. This year it was March 1st. Next year it's March 21. So there we are, top of their calendar is this Feast of Purim. Now why should this interest us? Or what's the significance of this? And is there a prophetic significance to the book of Esther? Do you remember during World War II the things that took place to the Jews? Remember Adolf Hitler tried to get rid of the Jewish race? They had concentration camps and estimates of up to six million people, Jews, were killed during this time. Now there's a lot of Holocaust deniers today. I've been to the Holocaust Museum in Israel and you can go to the, it's called Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. And they have recorded there by relatives, known people that were killed during this time, of at least one and a half million. So it was a lot of people. But of course we know the story. The Nazis lost World War II after much fighting, and they captured many of the top Nazis. And this is a picture taken at the Nuremberg Nazi war crime trials, which was held from the 20th of November 1945 up to October 1946, almost a year long, when the Nazis 
were brought to trial for causing World War II. And at the end of this long trial, they were going to hang the Nazi leaders that led this. They didn't catch Adolf Hitler, of course, because the story was he committed suicide, and Martin Baum, another top guy, disappeared. But these guys they caught, and after the trial, they sentenced 11 of them to death. But one of them, you can see him here, Hermann Goering, committed suicide the day that he was to be hung. And here's the newspaper reports from that time. Goering ends life in cell. Ten Nazis hang. So the other ten, of the eleven, ten were hung. Hitler's number one aide gulps poison. He poisoned himself in his prison cell, so he committed suicide. But the other ten were all hung. Goering suicide, ten Nazis hang. There's Goering, but the other ten were hung. Here's some more newspaper reports. Goering ends life by poison. Ten others hanged. Goering a suicide two hours before ten hang. Swallows hidden poison in Nuremberg cell. Now some people have pointed to this saying, look at this. Here's ten Nazis hung. Ten of these people that were trying to wipe out the Jews. And they're saying, look at the parallels. Back in the days of Esther, how many sons of Haman were hung? Ten. What were they trying to do? Trying to kill the Jews. And they were saying, see, Esther was all about this event in World War II. Is that what it's about? No, I don't believe so. Very interesting. But what are the real biblical end time parallels of the story of Esther? What is, is it really all about? And who, shall we say, is the evil player in the last days? Well, in the Bible it has many names. The little horn power in Daniel the Antichrist, the man of sin, the beast in Revelation 13, the second beast, the first beast, sorry. And in Revelation 17, what's it depicted as here? It's this woman riding a beast. It says, I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now we could do a whole study on what this power is. But essentially, it's the power based at the Vatican. We know that. And sure enough, all the leaders of the world come to pay homage, if you like, to give recognition to this power. And this power, ultimately, it says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Very sad. This entity is going to use civil power to again oppress God's people. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These are the ten parallels to Haman's son. It's the ten horns at the end of time that are going to work with the beast power to persecute God's people. These are the ten which are the parallel to Haman's ten sons. So is there going to be another death decree? Yes, there is. There's going to be another death decree coming in the last days. And here's a quick summary from early writings describing this. I saw the saints leaving the cities and villages and associating together in companies and living in the most solitary places. Angels provided them food and water while the wicked were suffering from hunger and thirst. Then I saw the leading men of the earth consulting together, and Satan and his angels busy around them. I saw a writing, copies of which were scattered in different parts of the land. Does that sound familiar? A writing. Giving orders that unless the saints should yield their peculiar faith, give up the Sabbath, and observed the first day of the week, the people were at liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Can you see the parallels here? Just like the decree of Ahasuerus, here's a death decree coming in the future, which is going to give on a certain day, giving them liberty after a certain time to put Sabbath keepers to death. That's going to be the issue in the future. Are you going to follow God's commandments or man-made commandments? If you don't follow the man-made ones, one day civil protection will be taken from these people and anyone can put them to death 
and take their property. Here's an interesting quote from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, 450. The decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. Those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield comes the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Now, as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. So there's a wonderful promise. Just as in the days of Esther, God is going to turn things around. So how does that happen? We keep reading the story in the Bible. The ten horns which thou sawest on the beast, these shall hate the whore. Remember they gave their power to the, to the whore for a while. Now it says they're going to hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So these ten horns on that beast that she's riding are going to turn on her and hate the whore. And this is where everything gets turned upside down, just like in the story of Esther. And there's an interesting verse in Revelation 18, speaking about this whore. It says, Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. Do you remember the story in Esther where Haman set up a gallows to to kill Mordecai, but who ended up getting hung on that gallows? It was Haman himself, the one who set it up. And here's the parallel, if you like. Those ten horns, which give their power to the harlot, are going to turn on the harlot, and what she wants to do to God's people is going to be done to her. So there's lots of amazing parallels. Here's just some of them from the Bible. You had King Ahasuerus, Paralleling, and Hazarus is called King of Kings, paralleling Christ, the King of Kings. Vashti, there was a disobedient queen, Vashti, who got divorced. Did God have a people that were effectively divorced, if you like, from him? Remember the Jews disobeyed God, did not accept Jesus the Messiah, and they were effectively divorced as a people group from him at the time of Jesus. But there was a new queen, Esther. And it says, she obtained grace and favor. Has God got a new people today? Yes, anyone who wants to become a Christian and follow Jesus will obtain grace and favor. Interesting word, Esther means star. And the Bible says that the faithful will shine as the stars forever and ever. Esther spent 12 months being purified before she came before the king. And God's church in the last days will be purified but this is through trials. Haman, the enemy of God's people, meant magnificent. And you know the corrupt church, that harlot woman, it says magnified itself in Daniel chapter 7 as the little horn power. There was a law to bow down before Haman. And likewise, there's going to be a law to worship the beast in his image. And there's going to be a death decree just as there was a death decree on all Jews and all provinces, there's going to be a universal global death decree in the end. And just as the death decree on the Jews was appointing a specific day for that decree to be carried out, likewise at the end there's going to be a specific day appointed for the death decree to be carried out. Some other nice parallels too. Remember the king was learning from the books, he was having the the Chronicles read to him, and he learned about Mordecai. What's our king doing at the moment up in heaven? According to Daniel 7, he's examining the books of record. The books were opened in this court case up in heaven. Rewards were given to Mordecai. And likewise, Jesus, when he comes back, is going to give his rewards to the saints. Remember, Ahasuerus stood up at the end in his wrath and likewise the Bible says Michael is going to stand up at that time of trouble Haman was pleading before Esther for his life and you can read in Revelation chapter 3 that the wicked will be pleading before the saints at the end as well 
Finally, there was a decree to slay the Jews' enemies. And you know there's going to be a, slay, a decree to slay the wicked when God speaks. And we're going to look at this in the next talk. The voice of God, that is effectively the death decree on the wicked. As they want to do to God's people, it's going to come back on them. You had the ten sons perishing, and you have the ten horns perishing. So what are the circumstances of this future death decree? What can we learn about that? Here's a quick summary giving the context of when this death decree will be. From early writings, I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. As long as Jesus is in that sanctuary, the winds are being held back. Mercy is still pleading for the human race. But when that's done, what happens? The four winds will be let loose. Then will come the seven last plagues. These plagues enraged the wicked against the righteous. They thought that we'd brought the judgments of God upon them, and that if they could rid the earth of us, the plagues would then be stayed. So what's the result? It says a decree went forth, to slay the saints, which caused him to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble. Then all the saints cried out with anguish of spirit and were delivered by the voice of God. That's the good news at the end. We could summarize all that, and we're going to do this in our next talk. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 24, and all these steps are spelled out in Matthew chapter 24 by Jesus. And we're going to look at that in the next talk. The abomination of desolation. So stay tuned. That will be our next study. And we're going to examine what Jesus said about these same events, the same things we've talked about just now. So let's close with a prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our dearest Heavenly Father, Lord, as we've just reviewed the story of Esther, and we know this story was not written just as an interesting piece of history, but it's prophetic in its significance. The things that have happened in the past are the things which will be in the future. Lord, we know there's going to be a tremendous crisis at the end. Things are going to reach a crescendo. There's going to be an intensity of things happening on this earth just before you come back. The good news is, Lord, we know the end of the story. We know that you step in and save your people. Lord, may we be counted worthy to be amongst those people that are delivered by your voice. Help us, Lord, to surrender, to be prepared and ready for that time of trial ahead, that we may be counted amongst that throng that will hear your voice. And Lord, we all want to hear that voice, well done, good and faithful servant, when we all get to heaven. So bless us and guide us that we may be amongst that vast throng that will be in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>